Students High, this video is about energy and work. Two, three essential questions. The first one, what are some common types of energy and how can we calculate quantities of each? The second one is what is the law of conservation of energy? And the third one is how are forces and energy related to the concept of work? Let's get right into it. One way of defining energy is to talk about it as the ability to do work or affect a change. Um, for example, moving objects store energy in what we call kinetic form. Um, kinetic energy is otherwise known as the energy of motion. And we most often talked about kinetic energy um, in books and websites, okay? Or I should say the most, it's most often talked about as kinetic energy. The most common formula for kinetic energy that we have is this one, where if you want to try, find the kinetic energy of an object, you just multiply its mass times the speed of the object squared and one half and poof, you have the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is measured uh, in joules or the SI unit for kinetic energy is joules. And if you look at the kinetic energy units, um, a mass is kilogram, velocity is meters per second. So it actually is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Or if you look at the stuff in parentheses there, what is that kilogram meter per second squared? Well, that's simply a Newton, right? And so you could also think of the kinetic energy as a Newton meter, Newton times meter. It's important to think about it that way as well. Energy stored in a gravitational field. Let's say we take a bowling ball and raise it to a certain height and let it go. Um, it's gonna fall, it's gonna speed up, speed up, gaining kinetic energy as it falls, right? And so because we've lifted the ball in a gravitational field, uh, gravitational field meaning that the earth, a big massive object exerts distorts space all around it in a certain way. Um, energy is stored in the ball um, because of its position in the gravitational field. And so we call that uh, type of energy as gravitational potential energy. And we usually put the lowercase p subscript to kind of signify that. So any form of potential energy can be thought of the energy an object possesses because of its relative position. And this is really important kind of transcends all types of, of potential energies. So here's that bowling ball goes up and then it drops, okay? So formula for potential energy or change in gravitational potential energy in this case um, is you take the mass of the object, multiply it by the acceleration due to gravity on whatever planet you're on and multiply it by the change in vertical height that it has experienced. And so uh, we most often talk about changes in potential energy because again, it's about the change in the relative position. Units would be joules as well. And it's also important to understand this concept called mechanical energy. Quite simply, mechanical energy is the sum of the two previous energy forms we've been discussing, kinetic and potential. So an equation for that would look like this. Take the kinetic energy of an object, add it to the potential energy, and you get the mechanical energy that an object has. This is a really important concept we're gonna talk about here. I think you've been exposed to it before. It's called the law of conservation of energy. And it basically says that we, if we have an isolated system, an isolated system is one where the boundaries are such that it does not allow mass nor energy to travel through it, to pass through its boundary. Um, if we have an isolated system, then energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can change forms of storage and it can be transferred between objects, but the total energy present in all the objects before a certain event, collision, whatever the case may be, has to equal the total energy after. And this relates to the Richard Feynman article that you should have read or should be reading soon about the kid and the number of blocks that it has at the beginning of the day and the end of the day when the mom counts them up again. Um, please note that energy can be transferred in and out of systems. We're going to talk about that more uh, in a later session. The other concept that's important to understand is this idea of dissipated energy or internal energy. Um, this is energy that is transferred to other objects in a way that spreads it out evenly. So forces like friction and drag, air resistance, will cause energy to be stored in a dissipated form. And the reason that's important is because dissipated energy is not a form of mechanical energy. So when you have friction and drag, the mechanical energy of a certain set of objects is going to change. It's not gonna remain the same. Let's do a quick joke. How do people feel when the fifth month is removed from their calendars? Dismayed. <laughs> All right, uh, there's a derivation I want to do here for you. You do not have to memorize this. You, I think you should just watch and kind of understand. Um, notice we have that formula for kinetic energy. We're going to do some uh, 
manipulations with it to see what we can find is an interesting result out of these manipulations. So again, no need to write this down. But notice you can see there, that's one of those kinematics equations we talked about in the beginning part of the year, right? Final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times the acceleration times the displacement. Well, notice I can multiply mass to both ends of that uh, equation, both sides of that equation, no big deal there. And if I distribute the mass, actually if I multiply both sides by one half, notice that on the left, one half mass at final velocity squared. Well, that's just really the final kinetic energy of an object, right? And notice if I distribute the one half m to the different things, I have on the left there, excuse me, on the right side of the equation, the first term there, one half m b i squared. Well, that's just initial kinetic energy, right? So now we have final kinetic energy of an object equals the initial kinetic energy plus the mass times the acceleration times the displacement. Mass times acceleration, mass times acceleration, where have I heard that before? That's just the net force that an object feels. So interesting thing here we have. If you look at this, if you take the change in kinetic energy uh, that an object experiences, then that equals the net force that the object is experiencing times the displacement through which it feels that net force. I just want to say this again. If you look at the change in the kinetic energy of an object, right, kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, that equals the force that the object feels, the net force it's feeling through the displacement that it's feeling that force. Well, that net force times the displacement, we give it a special word in physics, and that's called work. So um, work equals force times the displacement. Or, um, and basically, one important thing that you need to know is the work done by a constant force parallel to the displacement of the object. Okay, If the force is not constant, we can't quite use this equation in this form. We'd have to get into calculus. Um, that expression up above that I just derived, that is known as the work kinetic energy theorem. And it's definitely something you want to keep in the forefront of your mind, OK? Again, the change in kinetic energy of an object has to equal the work done on the object. And the work or working is this mechanism that we can think of and is meant in this model that we're going to be using. It can be thought of as the way that energy can be transferred into or out of a system. And you're going to do something called LOL diagrams in the coming weeks that helps, uh, helps you understand this better. Finally, one last thing, I just want to make sure you understand a little bit about elastic potential energy. And when I talk about elastic potential energy, I'm talking about coiled springs. So notice I have a coiled spring there. And if I displace or move that coiled spring a certain distance from its rest position or its equilibrium position, okay, we all know what's going to happen. The spring is going to exert a force to bring that mass back towards, to bring itself back towards the equilibrium position, its equilibrium position, and it's going to bring the mass with it. Right, And so that's Hooke's law, and I believe that's something that you learned before in maybe a previous physics class. It's certainly something that we'll talk about here some more. Uh, I can also push that spring in, and again, the same thing's going to happen. There's going to be a force that's trying to push that spring, get that spring to go back to its equilibrium position. So when we deform a coiled spring, we are storing energy in the spring. There is energy of relative position in the coils of the spring. Energy of relative position. That sounds like something Mr. Bob said earlier about potential energy. OK, uh, and I already mentioned that one. So this is a potential energy, right? Because it's related to the relative position of the coils in the spring. And it has a certain form. So elastic potential energy, if I want to calculate the amount of elastic potential energy, like in the spring mass system, what I need to do is I would need to measure the displacement, the delta x of the coiled spring from its equilibrium position, square that number, multiply it by something called the spring constant. That's what that k value is. Uh, the spring constant you can think of as a measure of the um, stiffness of the spring, okay? So a very stiff spring, one that requires a lot of force to basically move it from its equilibrium position is going to have a high spring constant. A very loose spring that's easy to move from its equilibrium position is going to have a low spring constant. Um, spring constant is usually measured in newtons per meter, and the displacement of the coils from their natural equilibrium position is usually measured in meters. So notice what I have there is I have Newtons per meter times a meter squared, what I end up with is a Newton times a meter. And we know a Newton meter is another way of saying a joule, which is a type of energy. So there you have it. Hopefully you have answers to these three essential questions. Thank you so much. Take care.